what I'll be speaking about today is the Ten Commandments and how the religion of socialism is replacing God's commandments with new ones. A great many people would say, well, it has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with the Ten Commandments. And what I would like to suggest to you is that it absolutely does. Um, what you hear often is religion has no place in politics. Uh, and frankly, most pastors, I think, believe that because most pastors are silent about these subjects from the pulpit. Um, beyond that, what you see is the pushing of the Bible and of religious thought out of the public square, pretty much everywhere, certainly in the United States. But then we have to say, does it really have no place? Um, this past uh, week, actually now two weeks back, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vagano uh, warned the president in a letter that the current crises over the coronavirus pandemic and the George Floyd riots are a part of the eternal uh, spiritual struggle between the forces of good and evil. So in other words, he's saying there's something much bigger going on here. And I'll just share with you um, the first paragraph of this letter. Mr. President, in recent months, we've been witnessing the formation of two opposing sides that I would call biblical, the children of light and the children of darkness. The children of light constitute the most conspicuous part of humanity, while the children of darkness represent an absolute minority. And yet the former are the object of a sort of discrimination which places them in a situation of moral inferiority with respect to their adversaries, who often hold strategic positions in government, in politics, in the economy, and in the media. In an apparently inexplicable way, the good are held hostage by the wicked, and by those who help them, either out of self-interest or fearfulness. So you are beginning to see, and this is scattered all over the nation and all over the world, um, individuals who are uh, generally Christian, committed to um, following God, who are now beginning to speak up. And you're beginning to see pastors speaking up. And you're beginning to see the church coming awake. What is religion? A good definition is Merriam-Webster's. Religion is a personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices. Mao's Marxism, his little red book, the Communist Manifesto, the various beliefs of Marxism, um, all place these things in the sphere of a religion. Now, when we look at our own country, the revolution here was driven by Christians. The British, by the way, blamed the Black Robe Regiment for America's independence. Um, what you see in the picture uh, on this uh, slide uh, is a group of, con of the Continental Army fighting in Springfield, New Jersey. The Battle of Springfield uh, was one where there was a, a group of British at Galloping Hill who were attacking, and the Continental Army ran out of the wadding that they needed for shooting their muskets. And so the pastor at that point James Caldwell, uh, who was the chaplain for the Continental Army, and, and by the way, had just lost his wife uh, uh, at the Battle of Connecticut Farms, he wound up going into the church and bringing out all the hymnals. And these were hymnals that were uh, published by the English clergyman Isaac Watts. And he just said to them, give them Watts, boys, give them Watts. Use the pages as wadding. Now, who was the Black Robe Regiment? Well, that was the name that the British placed on the courageous and patriotic American clergy during the founding era. And it was a backhanded reference to the black robes that they wore. Um, John Adams uh, in uh, 1818 
wrote that the pulpits have thundered, and he specifically identified several ministers as being among the, quote, characters, the most conspicuous, the most ardent, the most influential in the awakening and a revival of American principles and feelings that led to American independence. In other words, the, the, the pastors um, were really a whole regiment uh, that, uh, that drove the revolution. It's not that they were a regiment on the battlefield. Rather, they were the ones who were guiding, encouraging, strengthening, challenging the people uh, and giving to them a moral basis for the actions that they took. The Bill of Rights originated in the pulpits. Most people don't realize that. Um, here's an interesting quote. There is not a right asserted in the Declaration of Independence which had not been discussed by the New England clergy before 1763. And in actuality, for approximately 20 years before the revolution, the rights that would ultimately be enshrined in our Constitution were discussed from the pulpits of the um, various churches in this nation. The rights listed, this direct quote, in the Declaration of Independence were nothing more than a listing of sermon topics that had been preached from the pulpit in the two decades leading up to the American Revolution, but such was indeed the case. America, James Madison said, was founded on the Ten Commandments. Quote, we have staked the whole future of American civilization, not on the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of all of our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. So as they embarked on this grand new experiment in governance, uh, they knew that if the people were to govern the nation, that the people would first have to govern themselves. And they believed that the way to do that was for the people to be obedient to God's Ten Commandments and thereby develop the character, the moral fiber, uh, the um, ability just to control themselves so that they would not act solely out of self-interest. Uh, well, socialism slash Marxism is indeed a religion. Um, as this nation was founded out of a religious viewpoint, a religious beliefs, uh, other nations have been founded out of another religious belief, not Christianity, um, but socialism and ultimately Marxism. Black Lives Matter's founders have said, we are trained Marxists. Um, the first thing, this is a direct quote uh, from Patrice Colors who was a uh, co-founder, one of the three co-founders of Black Lives Matter. Uh, the first thing I think, she says, uh, is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Myself and Alicia, and that's Alicia Garza, one of the other co-founders in particular, are trained organizers. We are trained Marxists. Now, why did God give us the Ten Commandments? Many people think it is so that we can be saved, that that is the pathway to salvation. Uh, the reality is it's not a possibility. Jesus made it clear that the way that God judges the Ten Commandments makes it impossible for us to ever meet uh, this full standard because God judges the heart, not just uh, the outer, outer appearances. He said if we hate somebody, we're guilty of murder. If we lust, we're guilty of adultery. And by that measure, no one can measure up. Everyone falls short. Um, he didn't give it as an impossible pathway to salvation. Rather, uh, he gave it uh, to the Jews, to the Israelites, uh, as they were preparing to embark on their grand experiment of founding a nation, the nation of Israel. And he gave it to them so that they would have the basic rules of society that would enable that society uh, to establish itself and to endure. They are God-given rules that are given in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5 that provide guidance on how to build an enduring nation. 
Uh, in the book of Joshua, this basic um, sentiment is repeated many times throughout uh, the Old Testament. In the book of Joshua, it says this, you are therefore, uh, I'm sorry, you shall therefore keep every commandment I'm giving you today so that you may have the strength to go in and possess the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. And so that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them and their descendants. But be careful that you are not enticed to turn aside to worship and bow down to other gods or the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. He will shut the heavens so that there will be no rain, nor will the land yield its produce, and you will soon perish from the good land that the Lord is giving you. In other words, be obedient to these commandments. You will be successful. You will stay in the land. In Leviticus, it says it yet more clearly. Keep all my decrees, God says, and laws, and follow them, so that the land where I am bringing you to live may not vomit you out. Now, let's look at the Ten Commandments and see how this new religion, this religion of socialism, is replacing God's commandments with new ones. And of course, socialism is a religious slash economic system that generally has an atheist base. And it is the belief that man functions as God to straighten out the things that God, if he existed, has gotten wrong. The inequality of the distribution of wealth, uh, the uh, inequality of the distribution of talents, uh, the assignment of the wrong uh, sex to individuals that can ultimately be changed in some way, uh, the repairing of the climate, um, and so on. The first commandment, honor God above all. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. The new first commandment is this, destroy the church and honor the earth. Karl Marx said the first requisite of the happiness of the people is the abolition of religion. The Green New Deal is a religious document. And the Green New Deal says that it not only saves us from climate catastrophe, it also builds a just, sustainable, and healthy planet for our young people and future generations. And embedded within the Green New Deal is a concept of social justice in which we, the people, fix ourselves without God's help. The second commandment, do not worship other gods. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. It is no accident that our money says, in God we trust on it, because there is a great awareness uh, evidenced on the part of the founders and on the part of uh, our leaders for so many years that money so easily replaces God. Uh, Jesus said, you can't serve God and money. You can't serve two masters. You'll either hate one and love the other or love one and uh, hate the other. Socialism is all about the redistribution of money as if money is the ultimate solution for all of the needs of life. The new second commandment, worship and pray to the state. Because the state will provide. One of the names for God in scripture is Jehovah Jireh, which means God provides or God is the provider. And so we pray to God. Um, but people pray to the state. They say, um, oh, Mr. President, oh, Mr. Congressman or Congresswoman, um, oh, Senator, um, we need this. Send us money. Send money to our state. Send money to our school. Send money to whoever. Um, we pray to them. If there is a crisis of any type, 
uh, we go to the state. Um, in America, there is a new God that people can pray to. This new God will even subsidize your business. Ask Elon Musk. The new God has the power of life and death and destruction. The new God can bless you and the new God can punish you because this new God is a jealous God. Christians and Jews who worship the one true God have become the enemy of this new God in many places. The new God is not a compassionate father. He is an uncle, Uncle Sam. Elected representatives have become this new God's priests, intermediaries of the God. Like Baal and Moloch and the other ancient gods, he wants you to sacrifice your children to him. He takes from you everything he chooses. He can destroy you. The truth means nothing to him. He encourages envy and thrives on falsehoods. He permits no other gods. The God of the Bible has been cast out of government and now is being purged everywhere. And as you look at socialist slash Marxist systems all around the world, whether it's China, whether it's Russia, you can see how this God works. Venezuela, Cuba, God has become the enemy of the state. The state has made God its enemy, casting him out of the schools, out of the government, out of the public square, out of our laws, out of our books, and now officially moved, removed from one party's platform, an act, by the way, that was taken more than 12 years ago. The third commandment, do not take God's name in vain. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Well, the new third commandment is erase the name of God. On January 29th, 2019, it was reported that so help me God would be removed from the oath witnesses take when they testify before the House Committees on Natural Resources. In other words, in Congress, they no longer have people saying, so help me God. Now, if you were to go back to the founding of our nation in the first 200 years, um, you would see that in the early years, a witness could not testify if they were atheists. A witness could not testify if they did not believe in God. Um, also, people could not hold office if they had no faith. We're a long way from that. The reason they, that the, those strictures were in place was because they believed that if someone knew there was someone greater watching them, seeing them at all times, uh, if they believed in God, they would act uh, more honestly and more honorably. Various curse words can be spoken by our congressional representatives on the floor of the Senate or the floor of the House, but those who utter the name of Jesus are viewed by many as disqualified for office. You've seen some of the committees as they have met and interrogated people and the questions that have come up. And the claim when someone has talked about the Lord or talked about their faith, that therefore they must be biased. Um, and God's special people, the Jews, are viewed as particular threats. Anti-Semitism has grown rampant in the past few years as the identity politics of socialism has spread. Uh, in 2012, the big controversy that exploded at the Democrat National Convention uh, was over a move to restore a reference to God and the recognition of Ju Jerusalem as the capital of Israel that had been there in 2008, or actually had been removed in 2008. Republicans had criticized the omission of the references. Democrats uh, were at odds over the changes. Neither has been restored to the Democrat platform now in 2020. The fourth commandment, keep the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The new commandment, the new fourth commandment, every day will be a Sabbath provided to you by the state. The government now promises that every day will be a Sabbath, a day of rest from work. 
because you are promised a guaranteed minimum income, whether or not you work, or shortly you will be, um, if the socialists gain full power. The Green New Deal puts it this way, we will end unemployment in America once and for all by guaranteeing a job at a living wage for every American willing and able to work. And if you continue to read on, you discover it says whether willing or not. Um, Wall Street Journal article uh, in uh, their article titled A Guaranteed Income for Every American um, made it clear that under socialism, should the United States embrace it in our federal government, the state will give every person, worker or not, a guaranteed income, a seven-day Sabbath for all. Peace is redefined. Karl Marx said the meaning of peace is the absence of opposition to socialism. Political correctness is an attempt to stamp out all opposition so that everybody thinks rightly, making us all, should we choose to embrace it, a nation of zombies. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. There's a promise in it. Honoring your parents keeps you in the land. Honoring your parents um, keeps you living longer. The new fifth commandment, disregard your parents. Ignore what they've told you. Ignore how they raised you. Instead, honor your professors. Um, and beyond that, destroy the nuclear family. BlackLivesMatter.com in their section, What We Believe, um, says this, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. And as you read through blacklivesmatter.com and you listen to the founders, you discover that they have embraced a concept of the family that uh, is not a family at all. It's just any combination of anyone, any mix of sex, any mix of anything, um, they um, are seeking the rights of transgenders and they ignore, uh, in, in surprisingly, um, the rights of black men. Read the site for yourself. Uh, we spoke a bit about this last week. The sixth commandment, do not murder. You shall not murder. Well, the new sixth commandment is kill your children before or even after they are born. And oh, by the way, make it easy uh, for the elderly to die. If a mother is in labor, I can tell you exactly what would happen, Ralph Nordham, governor of Virginia, said. The infant would be delivered. The infant would be kept comfortable. The infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. Prior to these comments, he explained that these scenarios arise in cases of children with severe deformities. Infanticide. Let the child be born and then kill the child. Well, there's nothing so special when the child comes out of the womb and into this world that suddenly magically makes it a child uh, it was a child before it was born, but in multiple states, including New York, it is okay uh, to have an abortion up through the time of birth. And when that was passed, by the way, uh, in uh, the New York um, uh, Assembly, the Democrats stood up and cheered. Check it out for yourself. The seventh commandment, marriage is sacred. You shall not commit adultery. The new seventh commandment, marriage is only a legal contract. Marriage is whatever the state says it is. Gender is a fluid state of mind. If God got your sex wrong, you can change it. In Washington, the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, this is from 61520, an article CBS News, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled Monday that it is illegal for an employer to fire someone 
because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, delivering a major victory in the fight for civil rights for LGBTQ people. Um, this court six to three ruling extends the scope of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which bars discrimination on the basis of sex, race, color, national origin, and religion to include LGBTQ people. Okay, there are no limits and traditional marriage um, plus um, the church now will wind up being in a major conflict uh, as a result of this religion. The new morality. Um, in the past, it was clear adultery is a sin against your spouse and a sin against your children. Not only is adultery today permitted by the government, all forms of sexual deviance are promoted and most are legal. The chief battle is no longer adultery. That was removed from our legal system years ago. Hawthorne's scarlet letter today is passe. The battle today is over a brand new concept. You can change your gender. God made a mistake. The government will pay for you to be remade in whatever way you wish and legally protects you and your rights. And some doctors, eager for your money, are more than willing to comply. The Eighth Commandment, do not steal. You shall not steal. The New Eighth Commandment, take from those who have. Correct the inequality of wealth by stealing from those who have more. And the government may help you. During an interview with CNN host Chris Cuomo, Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin jokingly stated that the area could hold a summer of love alluding to a mass gathering of peace activists in 1967 in San Francisco. Um, now that was in the first days. That section known as Chaz or Chop today is a mess. There have been murders, uh, there's been looting. Uh, there are now lawsuits going on from the business owners. Um, Cuomo asked her, how long do you think Seattle and those few blocks look like this? I don't know. She said we could have a summer of love. Well, we didn't, and they didn't, and it's tragic. Socialism, you see, encourages theft. Politicians now openly want the government to steal. It's not just the looters in the street. The Eighth Commandment assumes the existence of private property. You cannot steal what someone does not own. So there are many politicians who claim that your money is not yours. And you've even heard some say, that's not yours, you didn't earn it. Bill de Blasio, mayor of New York City, said this, there's plenty of money in this city, it is just in the wrong hands. And he viewed it as government responsibility to get it into the right hands. Others wish to tax at 90%. The federal government taxing earnings at 90% is theft. A tithe is left for the one who earned it, except out of that tithe, out of that 10%, um, you will see taxes taken out from the states uh, and from municipalities, excise taxes and other taxes. And how much then would someone actually be left with? How is that different from stealing almost everything you have? But there's a far subtler form of theft. Socialism at its root encourages theft as a necessary part of its core ethos. The people of, Venezuela's, of Venezuela most recently discovered this fact. Theft by the government came as businesses were nationalized. Even more insidious is socialism's core belief that the economy is a zero-sum game and there is only so much money to go around. If one person has more, he or she only has it because they have stolen it from someone who has less. Therefore, the government on your behalf has a right to take it back. The new God of the socialist state will correct that inequity in the name of fairness. Or you can take it back yourself and your action will be viewed as socially just and fair. The whole reparations movement flows from this whole uh, attitude of envy. The Nazis reason that if the Jews in the 1940s uh, had money, it was because they stole it. The state has a right uh, nay, an obligation to take it back. If the wealthy white business owners have money, it is because they earned it on the backs of black and brown laborers. The state has a right, even an obligation, to take it back. If a French worker works more than his allotted hours, 
he is stealing a job from someone else since there are just so many hours of work in the socialist mindset. The government has the right and the obligation to fine him for working too much, and they do. People become envious of those who have much, believing those who have, own, those who have only have it because they've stolen it from those who have less. Capitalism, on the other hand, is not a zero-sum game. An entrepreneur who gets wealthy creates wealth for others, creates jobs, creates opportunities, and expands the wealth. The Ninth Commandment, do not bear false witness. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. A single witness shall not rise up, we read in Deuteronomy, against a man on account of any inequity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. In other words, a single witness is insufficient. Um, and yet we have moved into a time in our society where corroborator, corroborating evidence is no longer required. And the new ninth commandment is this, truth is relative. Each person has their own truth. It goes beyond that because people don't care if there is any corroboration. Um, it eliminates even the possibility of having a discussion uh, when you immediately say, as they did with the Judge Kavanaugh hearings, just believe the woman one person's claim. And if you have three or four or 10 people all claiming that somebody did the same thing, but at different times to different people, that is not corroboration. Um, or you've heard it said, where there is smoke, there must be fire. If the charge is big enough, uh, if the charge is so serious, something must have gone out or at the very, or happened at the very least, if the charge is so serious, we have to investigate so that anyone can bring down anyone else just through allegations. Um, university codes of justice permit one witness, uh, and that is a major change to traditional rules of evidence, which were based on the scriptures, by the way. We see fake news, false witness. And what is the purpose of fake news? The people never give up their liberties, but under some delusion. And so it creates a great delusion. Well, our government rests in public opinion, Abraham Lincoln said. Whoever can change public opinion can change the government practically so much. The 10th commandment, do not covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. The new 10th commandment, take whatever you want. They didn't earn it. You have as much of a right to it as they do. Socialism is based on envy. Someone else has my stuff. Without envy, there is no socialism. Winston Churchill said it very clearly. Socialism is a philosophy of failure, the creed of ignorance, and the gospel of envy. Its inherent virtue is the equal sharing of misery. Uh, George Gilder, the futurist, wrote this. If government could create jobs and raise children, socialism would have worked. The zero-sum uh, caric caricature applies much more accurately to socialism, which stifles the creation of new wealth and thus fosters a dog-eat-dog -dog struggle over existing material resources. In other words, it creates a zero-sum game because it minimizes the capability of the people to create new resources. History tells us that the threat to prosperity is not debt, but socialism. Socialism is an insurance policy bought by all the members of a national economy to shield them from risk. But the result is to shield them from knowledge of the real dangers and opportunities. Now, the question comes in this rise of a new religion, where is the church? Well, many pastors are afraid to speak and therefore say nothing. And of course, the church has been shut down in many places for an extended period. Um, but politics has now invaded religion. Aside from overruling the First Amendment, uh, we are seeing a new religion with a new God and new commandments 
taking over America with a religious zeal unmatched by the church. Consider the commandments in light of the religion of socialism, as we've gone through. Should we not preach against a religion that rejects every one of the Ten Commandments? And yet the pulpits have been strangely silent. Oh, there are some pastors who speak out, but precious few. It is my hope and my prayer that we would see a new black robe regiment arise and that the preaching would be about the day-to-day lives that people are encountering that are lived within this system that right now, this political and economic system is being transformed. Should we not preach against a religion that rejects every one of the Ten Commandments? Of course we should. And when you consider that it has been the love of God that has driven freedom in the world, slavery was ended by Christians. The abolition movement in America was led by Christians. The abolition movement in England was led by William Wilberforce, who was encouraged by John Newton. Uh, Wilberforce said this, it is the true duty of every man to promote the happiness of his fellow creatures to the utmost of his power. The Reverend Martin Luther King, the Reverend Martin Luther King, okay, a churchman, led the movement that ended Jim Crow. Do you think seriously that a looting mob of atheists, anarchists, socialists, and Marxists who are driven by envy can bring us to a better world? In other revolutions, they have gone for the statues first. And then as the revolution proceeds, it is not statues they topple. It is people. What will you do? I'm only one. I can't do everything. But I can do something. The something that I can do, I will do. Edward Everett Hale, the son of Nathan Hale.